Hi, my name is Mark Wilde. Uh, I'm, I'm a professor at Louisiana State University with a joint appointment in the physics department, physics and astronomy department in the Center for Computation and Technology. I'm currently on sabbatical at Stanford for the calendar year 2020. And uh, in part motivated by the coronavirus situation, I decided to take some of my research and just present it online and upload it to YouTube because uh, I think, you know, some students uh, who might not normally get to attend conferences and presentations uh, would, would have a chance to do so. So what I'm going to present is joint work that I did uh, last year with Shin Wang. At the time, he was a postdoc at University of Maryland. Now he's working at Baidu Research in Beijing. And the topic is this concept called alpha logarithmic negativity. If you've studied quantum information theory before, you might have heard of the logarithmic negativity entanglement measure. It's a very popular one because it's uh, relatively easy to compute. And um, it's, it's been used a lot by experimentalists uh, when calculating entanglement, trying to measure it in some way. It's also easy to compute it for Gaussian states, um, bosonic Gaussian states. There's a simple formula that's a function of the covariance matrix. So it's gotten a lot of attention. And what we're doing in this work is we're proposing a family of logarithmic negativity measures that interpolate between the original one and uh, a, a, another one that Shin and I introduced in a previous work. Uh, in that work, we called it kappa entanglement. But in the new work, we realized that it corresponds to the value alpha equal infinity. And so we call it max logarithmic negativity. So I'm going to get into that in a bit more detail. Okay, so let's review entanglement a bit and what its meaning is. And the way it's traditionally defined is by starting with what it's not. And what it is not is a separable or unentangled state. So if a bipartite state can be written in this form, then it's an unentangled state. So what does this form mean? There's a probability distribution over, over an alphabet with letters I. And corresponding to each letter, there's a product quantum state. So this rho i a, rho i b are density operators. So positive semi-definite matrices with trace equal to one. And what is the interpretation of this state is that it can be prepared by a classical procedure. So someone else could flip a multi-sided coin or, you know, like a die randomly according to this distribution and then outcome i is obtained and then the the outcome of the coin flip could be sent to alice could be sent to bob who would then prepare alice would prepare rho i a bob would prepare uh, rho i b and such a procedure is called local operations in classical communication to prepare the state you don't need any kind of uh, quantum encoding to do so you don't need a global unitary to do so. So it's an unentangled state. This, this definition of entanglement was proposed by Reinhard Werner, I believe in a 1986 paper that's very famous now. So an entangled state, as we said, is a state that cannot be written in that form. And what we were describing, the procedure that can be used to prepare a separable state is local operations in classical communication. So the distribution of the outcome of the coin flip, that's called uh, shared randomness, and that can be communicated classically. And then the, the parties, Alice and Bob, we, we assume that they're in distant laboratories. They can perform local operations to prepare uh, row I, A, Alice would prepare that, Bob would prepare this row I, B. So these, the LOCC uh, class of operations, uh, this was discussed 
in a, in a mathematical paper. It was introduced by Bennett, uh, DiVincenzo, uh, Smolin, and Wooters in a, in a famous 1996 paper on entanglement theory. And more recently in 2014, Eric Chitambra and, and colleagues uh, sort of discussed its mathematical structure. And the thing about LOCC is that uh, it has a, a complicated mathematical structure. And so after the original work of Bennett and others, uh, people tried to figure out simpler ways or simpler classes of operations that would contain LOCC. The most, one of the most famous ones is the class of positive partial transpose operations. Also, you know, that's abbreviated as PPT. That was introduced by Eric Raines around 1998-1999. And so that's been a, a common approach to, to help in understanding LOCC to simplify the, the mathematics. Okay, so one of the main rules of entanglement is that entangled states cannot be created by these free operations, LOCC. And that, in fact, that's how we define entanglement. You know, so these LOCC operations can only create separable states. And um, this original work on entanglement theory by Bennett et al, it inspired more broadly this, a, a way of thinking um, that's called the resource theoretic approach where you have some set of states that you determine are free. In this case, it's the separable states and some set of operations that you allow for free. And uh, these are the LOCC operations. So there's been all kinds of work on quantum resource theories. In fact, there was a, a workshop in Banff that uh, my, my colleagues and I attended in summer 2019. That was about this general and broad topic. So other resource theories include uh, thermodynamics. This has been reformulated as a resource theory. Also, uh, it's called magic states in the context of quantum computation. There's a coherence resource theory, uh, which has been quite popular to contribute to uh, because it gets at foundational aspects of quantum mechanics. And there are other resource theories. Um, and it seems that new resource theories pop up uh, because it's, it's such a powerful way of thinking um, that, that you know, has come about in the past two decades. Okay, so this is what I was just saying, you know, uh, thermodynamics, coherence, and then I missed one. Uh, Non-Gaussianity is a very important resource theory. Um, in the context of bosonic states and channels, because we know that to do universal quantum computing over a set of bosonic modes, these are like the continuous versions of qubits, you need non-Gaussian operations to have universal quantum computation. So that's been an important topic, that's been an important resource theory as well. Okay, so these are just kind of some broad statements before we get into the main stuff. So why is entanglement important? Well, it's really at the heart of many protocols uh, in quantum information science. So in quantum communication, you can think of it as the fuel behind teleportation, superdense coding, and more broadly entanglement assisted capacities of quantum channels. Um, there's evidence that it's a resource for quantum computing. And then of course, in quantum cryptography uh, with the Eckert protocol for QKD, it's a very important resource. You know, there's a concept called monogamy of entanglement, where if two parties, say Alice and Bob, have a quantum state that's maximally entangled and pure, in a pure form, the implication is that the rest of everyone else in the rest of the universe is in a tensor product state uh, with Alice and Bob. And so any measurement that they do that other parties in the universe do in their systems, if indeed Alice and Bob share a maximum entangled state, the measurement results are independent of the measurement outcomes of Alice and Bob. And so this concept is extremely uh, interesting and useful 
or secret key generation. So it's also at the heart of quantum cryptography. Okay, so one goal of quantum information theory after entanglement was realized to be critical for these things like teleportation, dense coding, and cryptography is to develop a quantitative theory. So how can we quantify entanglement? And that's what's usually called uh, entanglement theory. And um, there are two approaches to entanglement theory that uh, can coincide also. One is called the operational approach. So you think of it in terms of like the way that Shannon did in information theory. Um, from noisy entanglement, how much pure form entanglement can we extract? And this is called the distillation process. And the, when, when, you th when you think about entanglement distillation, you, you allow only for LOCC operations for free. So the point is that if you have this noisy entanglement um, and then you can distill out the pure form entanglement, then it can be used for protocols like teleportation, quantum key distribution, et cetera. So that's the operational approach. Um, you can also think of, so we were thinking of a distillation task, going, going from a noisy resource to a noiseless one. You can think about the reverse process. How efficiently can you convert a noiseless resource um, like maximally entangled bell states to noisy to a noisy resource like an arbitrary quantum state and this is called the entanglement cost problem so the quantities that I'm speaking about today or at least this one the max logarithmic negativity it's directly relevant for the entanglement cost problem okay so that was the operational approach to entanglement theory the other approach is the axiomatic approach. So you think of some basic axioms that are reasonable for entanglement, and then you try to prove that uh, mathematical functions of quantum states satisfy those axioms. And in the axiomatic approach, the, the basic idea is, is what we said right here. Um, entanglement, well, in addition to this, not only can entanglement not be created by LSCC, but also it should not increase under LOCC. So that's a fundamental axiom in the axiomatic approach. And then there are other axioms that are desirable. Okay, so yes, let's get into this now and we'll talk about the axiomatic approach. So we say that an entanglement measure E is faithful um, if it's equal to zero if and only if the state on which it's being evaluated, the state for which it's being evaluated is a separable state. So the idea is that the separable states should have the lowest value of entanglement and it should be equal to zero. Okay. The next axiom, and so faithfulness is, is satisfied by some of the important entanglement measures. So I'll, I'll mention at least two important entanglement measures. One is relative entropy of entanglement. This was invented by Martin Planio and Vlako Vidral. And uh, another important one is squashed entanglement, which is based on conditional mutual formation. This was invented by Andreas Winter and Matthias Christendel. Okay, the next axiom is LOCC monotonicity. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, or just, just a minute ago. Entanglement should not increase under the action of an LOCC channel. And um, then there are other properties like uh, convexity and additivity that are desirable. Okay. There's a, there's a whole zoo of entanglement measures. Um, I listed here some review articles, uh, and these slides that I, I, I'm speaking about, they're available online. I have this uh, website on scribd.com, S-C-R-I-B-D.com. If you look at my account there, you can, you can find these slides. Okay, so there's a large variety of entanglement measures, and here I'm pointing to two good reviews. 
uh, Plano in Vermont, 2007, and Christendel, his PhD thesis, 2006. There's another excellent review by the Horodesky uh, family that was published in Reviews of Modern Physics around 2007, 2008, something like that. Okay, so um, this is the axiomatic approach. And then the other approach is the operational or information theoretic approach, where you have some information processing task, and it's the task that gives the meaningful way to quantify a resource. So one task that we spoke about was distillation. Another task is the cost task, which is also known as dilution. Okay, so we were talking earlier about how LOCC is difficult to deal with mathematically. Um, in fact, you know, deciding whether a quantum state is uh, separable or entangled is an NP hard problem. So what do I mean by that? If you're given a mathematical description of a quantum state as a density operator, you write down all the numbers in the matrix, then it's known that um, solving this problem is NP, NP hard. So as the dimension of the state gets larger and larger, um, according to these computer science uh, conjectures, which are you know, strongly believed that they're true, it's going to be, um, th there will not be a polynomial time algorithm that can decide if a quantum state is separable or entangled. Um, and th there are other ways to phrase the entanglement complexity problem. Another way is you think of uh, a quantum circuit that could generate a bipartite state. So, you know, there's some sequence of gates that you act with on qubits prepared in the all zero state. And then it outputs three systems and you trace over, you know, one is a reference system, one is for Alice, one is for Bob. You trace over a res reference system, it makes a mixed state. And um, I wrote a paper uh, with Patrick Hayden and Ke Kevin Milner, uh, which, which showed that this variance of the entanglement problem is, um, is something called QSCK hard, and it's still NP hard also. So what does that mean? It's, it's very hard to decide to, whether a quantum state is entangled or not. And then even more difficult would be deciding whether, whether a quantum operation is LOCC or not. Or, and then related to that, if you want to optimize over separable states or optimize over LOCC channels, that's going to be hard to do. So it's a hard problem, and um, it can be helpful to kind of move on a bit and, and think of ways to make the class more uh, tractable by like enlarging the class. And so that was this concept. Um, this was an early concept by Asher Perez and the Horodesky family called the positive partial transpose criterion. So what does that mean? Um, if I have a bipartite operator, then this operation is the partial transpose. Um, so what is it doing? If you were to write down the matrix YAB and divide it into sectors, uh, then you would, you would have these sub-matrices, and on each of those you would do a transpose, okay? And that is called the partial transpose, and that's what this operation is doing. So as it turns out, um, if you do this operation on a separable state, let's go back to the definition, if you do this on a separable state, um, the partial transpose will be, it's, it's a linear operation, so it'll come inside the sum, and <clears throat> it'll do a full transpose on each of these density matrices. Well, if you do that, um, a full transpose on a density matrix still gives you a density matrix, and so the overall state is still a legitimate quantum state. However, if you, it was recognized early on, if you do this partial transpose on the Bell state, then you will no longer have a quantum state. And um, 
So, so the way the implication goes is that if a state is separable, then it has a positive partial transpose. And we just say that briefly as the state is PPT. Um, so the contrapositive of that is that um, if a state has a negative partial transpose, then it's entangled. So it's called a one-way entanglement detection criterion. And it doesn't violate what I said about MP hardness of deciding separability because it's just this one-way thing. Um, and you know, from the whole discussion we've had on this slide, you can infer that there exists entangled states that are PPT, okay? Right, so this is what we were just saying a minute ago. Okay, so from this, we can, we can start thinking about, if we wanna simplify the theory of entanglement, uh, this is what Reigns proposed in 1999 and 2001 in these two papers that were sort of companions to each other. So he didn't declare it as such, but what he was effectively doing was proposing a modification of the resource theory of entanglement to be a resource theory of uh, NPT entanglement, non-positive partial transpose entanglement. So in this resource theory, the PPT, the PPT states are free and the NPT states are resourceful. Um, why is that useful and meaningful? We said that there exists some uh, PPT states that are entangled, and so those would be resourceful in the original resource theory of entanglement. The thing about those is that it's known from those states, uh, you, you cannot distill any maximal entanglement. And so in that sense, they're, they're not very useful. They don't contain much entanglement. But there are exotic things that can happen with PPT entangled states, so you shouldn't neglect that entirely. Okay, so in this resource theory, the PPT states are free. And then what are the free operations? They're what are called um, completely PPT preserving operations. Okay, so if you have a bipartite state, rho AB, and then a channel acts on the bipartite state to, to make output systems A prime and B prime, uh, the bipartite channel, so this is like a global action that Alice and Bob can do. We say that it's C PBTP, or perhaps just PBT for short, if um, the, the, the conjunction of doing a partial transpose then the channel, and then a partial transpose on B prime, if that is still a physical map. So what does that mean? Um, what is a physical map? Any quantum channel is a physical map and it's uh, completely positive and trace preserving. So I won't say what those things are. Uh, those are things you can, you can learn in a quantum information theory course or review article. Um, so these bipartite channels that are PBT, um, they don't have much ability to create entanglement. Um, all they can do on their own is create PBT entangled states, which we already said don't have much entanglement. So it's reasonable to consider these the free operations. What is nice about this is that um, it is easy to specify this mathematically, uh, this condition of being a PPT preserving channel. And you can do something, you can construct the Choi operator. That's another concept, uh, like a foundational concept in quantum information theory that you can learn in a review article or a course. Um, in, in simple terms, the Choi operator of a quantum channel is the matrix you get uh, when you when the channel acts on one share of a maximum entangled state. In this case, the Choi operator would be um, a maximum entangled state between a reference system, you can call it like RA and RB, and uh, the systems that are input to the channel, which are A and B, okay? So uh, the Choi operator for a quantum channel it satisfies two criteria. The first is that it's a positive semi-definite matrix. 
And uh, the second is that if you trace over the output systems, A prime and B prime, the, if you do a partial trace, the remaining operator is the identity operator. Um, so the, the positive semi-definite of the Choi operator corresponds to complete positivity of the channel. And that partial trace criterion corresponds to trace preservation. Okay, so that's Choi operator. And then um, if a bipartite channel is PBT preserving, that means if you take the Choi operator and you do the partial transpose on both B and B prime, then it's positive semi-definite. So these two things are equivalent. That's something you can prove and maybe that would be an interesting exercise. Alternatively, you can find it in Rain's paper. Okay, one of the main observations of Rain's is that all LOCC channels are PPT preserving, okay? And so if you're trying to, let's say bound, how much entanglement you can generate by acting on a resourceful state with an LOCC channel, um, you can enlarge the set of operations and to, to this PPT preserving and then uh, find a bound using that criterion instead. And then it, it might be simpler to do so. And so we've seen a lot of work on that kind of thing. Um, I, I, I did some of that kind of work uh, in collaboration with Stefan Boimel and Siddharth Das. Okay, good. So that's, that's, you know, what we can say about this resource theory of NPT entanglement. What is the logarithmic negativity? That was one of the first things I was saying at the beginning. This is a very popular entanglement measure. It's defined like this. Um, you take the, the partial transpose of the state and then you evaluate the, the trace norm or the Shatten one norm. And then you take the log, uh, which is, effectively like converting the units to, to bits. You take the binary logarithm to convert the units to bits. Um, so, you know, if you do this, let's think about some examples. Uh, if you do this for a separable state, what happens? You take the partial transpose and you still have a quantum state. The trace norm of a quantum state is one and then uh, the, the log of one is zero. And so according to the logarithmic negativity, um, it's the, the, the measure evaluates to zero for a separable state, which makes sense. Similarly, if the state is positive partial transpose, PPT, uh, that means that this trace norm will also evaluate to one. And so the log of that is zero, and then the measure will be zero for um, <clears throat> for a PBT state. If you were to evaluate this for a maximum entangled state, you would, you would work through the calculation. And let's say the maximum entangled state had Schmidt rank D, then this would be equal to log of D. And so for a simple Bell state of two qubits, this would evaluate to one. And you can think about like, oh, this has one EBIT of entanglement. This measure was introduced, um, I, I suppose, independently by Vidal and Werner and Planio. Um, if you read Planio's archive post, you can read about kind of the history. Um, what Planio did is that um, he proved that this property holds the the entanglement monotonicity or the LOCC monotonicity. This is actually slightly stronger uh, than, than what we stated on the previous slide. So what we stated on the previous slide was this, is LOCC monotonicity. Um, so what Planio showed was a, a bit uh, stronger and in fact implies the previous one. So, we talked about uh, PPT preserving channels. You can have something called the PPT preserving instrument. And this is a, a channel, this is a bipartite channel that would output um, three systems. One would be an output for Alice, one would be an output, output for Bob, 
And the other would be a classical system, uh, which, which can be copied and sent to both Alice and Bob. And so the state of those three systems uh, for an instrument is described by an ensemble of states. You know, there's a certain probability that, the class, that a particular classical outcome occurs, and then corresponding to each classical outcome, there's a quantum state. And so the, 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 the statement that uh, Planio was able to prove is this one, um, that th the entanglement does not increase on average uh, under this kind of operation. And then a special case is a, CP, is a PPT preserving channel. So if there's no classical outcome, or if there's just one classical outcome, then the probability would be one, and there would just be one state here. And so uh, this is stronger than what we said on the previous slide. Um, the other thing that's known is that the logarithmic negativity is faithful on PPT states. We actually talked about that on the previous slide, um, but it's a two-way thing. So the, the, the thing that we talked about in the previous slide is that if it's PPT, the logarithmic negativity is zero. The opposite implication holds as well. And there's an interesting proof you can, you can go through uh, to arrive at that conclusion. Um, but you know, if, if you plug in the state and the logarithmic negativity evaluates to zero, then you can actually conclude from that that the state is PPT. So that's the statement of faithfulness. Okay, the other thing about logarithmic negativity that Plenio showed, uh, and, and actually it might have been Vidal and, and Werner uh, before that, is that it's um, neither convex nor monogamous. Um, so, you know, there are certain definitions for those. Um, convexity is different from this statement right here about entanglement monotonicity. Um, I don't know, I think I might define convexity later on. And I think I might define monogamy later on. If, if I don't, I'll, I'll talk about it. Okay, so then logarithmic negativity was defined many years ago. And then recently with Shin, uh, we, we defined in this paper, we called it uh, kappa entanglement following a tradition of Shin, whenever he invents a new measure, which he's done many times, he assigns a Greek letter to it. And since kappa was free, we chose it for, for this entanglement measure. In the work I'm presenting today, uh, after we did this original work, we discovered that it can be interpreted as max logarithmic negativity. And it's actually in a, a family that's related to logarithmic negativity. So that's kind of the, the interesting, one of the interesting conclusions of this work. So how do we define it? Um, well, like this, it's defined in terms of an optimization. So it's a function of the state rho AB. You plug it in, you try to find a bipartite operator satisfying these two operator inequalities and this one. Um, these two operator inequalities actually imply that SAB is positive semi-definite. How do you see that? Well, SAB is greater than minus SAB. So you can move the minus SAB to the right and you get two SAB greater than zero. That means that SAB is positive semi-definite. And then you're trying to minimize the trace of this operator, okay? So that's the kappa entanglement and the way that we arrived at this entanglement measure was through the operational or information theoretic approach. Um, so there was a, a task called exact entanglement cost with PPT operations. Uh, the PPT operations are what I described in the previous slide. And uh, this quantity ended up being the optimal asymptotic exact PPT entanglement cost. Okay, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but that's its meaning. The other great thing about this entanglement measure is that it can be computed by a semi-definite program. So, um, 
Semi-definite programming comes up a lot in, in modern quantum information. It comes up in all of the subfields of quantum information science, including quantum communication, quantum cryptography, quantum complexity theory, et cetera, quantum communication complexity. So it's an important tool to learn. Uh, a lot of people in quantum information learn it from the notes of John Watrous, which are very good. And I think it's in his new book as well. Um, so what does that mean uh, in simple terms? Given a mathematical description of the state, you can write a MATLAB program that will calculate the optimal solution in time polynomial in the, in the dimension of the state as well as in the inverse accuracy desired. Okay. So these are some things I was just saying, um, computed by STPs. Also, it has a direct information theoretic meaning in this resource theory of MPT entanglement. Um, it is an entanglement monotone. That's kind of a sensible thing that would happen if it arises as the answer to an operational task. It's also faithful on PPT states. So it's equal to zero if and only if the state is PPT. But it's also like the logarithmic negativity, neither convex nor monogamous. Okay. And then for some special states, like two qubit states, and bosonic Gaussian states, it reduces to the logarithmic negativity. So it has a relation to it as this kind of collapse on special states. But in general, it can, it can be different. And in fact, we're gonna see, you know, the logarithmic negativity and cap entanglement are two extremes of a whole family of logarithmic negativity entanglement measures. Okay, so what's the, Relation, I, well, I guess I already answered the question, uh, but this is the, the main question of this paper that I'm talking about. Um, and it's exactly as I said, these, these two entanglement measures are extremes of a family of entanglement measures. If you've studied uh, Renyi entropy or Renyi relative entropy, those are families of entropic measures that have as special cases uh, Shannon entropy or Shannon relative entropy for the classical case and uh, the von Neumann or Umagaki quantities for the quantum case. And, um, you know, the, the other extremes of the, the, the Renyi families are the min entropy and the max relative entropy. So it's kind of similar to that, uh, but there are some differences. We did use the, the, letter alpha to indicate that it's the concept is similar to the Renyi concept. The letter alpha is often used for Renyi entropies and Renyi relative entropies. Okay, so to understand why this happens, we need to develop some uh, mathematical quantities. Okay, and so we're going to establish some notation here. Uh, it's, it's a little mathematical, but not, not too heavy than what follows. So whenever we write alpha, we mean a real number greater than or equal to one, and it can, you know, we will consider the limit as alpha goes to infinity. Uh, we're gonna let x be a Hermitian operator, it's not equal to zero, and sigma is gonna be a positive semi-definite operator. So that's the notation we'll need, just those three symbols. And then here's some further notation. When we write mu, sub alpha x sigma, um, we mean this weighted alpha norm. Uh, so, you know, that's also called Shatten alpha norm. If you don't know what that means, pause the video and look it up on Wikipedia uh, and then come back. So we define it like this. And what you see is that in this weighted alpha norm, um, when alpha is greater than one, you're actually taking an inverse of sigma. Okay, so because that happens, you, you kind of need um, to consider this, this mathematical uh, condition such that this norm makes sense. And the condition we consider is um, a support condition. So we'll write it this way. 
if the support of X is contained in support of sigma, and then otherwise we'll set it to be plus infinity. So this is a key quantity. Um, if you've studied some recent works in quantum information theory, you might've run across sandwiched Renyi relative entropy. And um, there are some similarities between this, this quantity, uh, this mu alpha and the sandwiched Renyi relative entropy. So that's mu. And then if we take the binary log, we get nu. And the reason we use nu is because it's, it's, the out, it's gonna be the alpha, it's gonna be a quantity from which we get the alpha logarithmic negativity. So nu is like for negativity. Okay, and these are very interesting mathematical quantities and the properties that we need uh, to, to understand the alpha logarithmic negativity, they can be derived by, um, from, from papers of Salman Beghi, he had a 2013 paper, and uh, Fumio Hii, his 2016 paper. His 2016 paper. Um, Hii has had a lot of uh, important mathematical works in quantum information theory. A key example is um, he, he co-authored with Dennis Petz the, the paper that gave the correct and fundamental information theoretic meaning of quantum relative entropy. So it's really this foundational work that uh, set a blueprint for all of quantum information theory that followed. That, that work was done in 1991, and he's consistently uh, contributed these mathematically fundamental works to quantum information theory. Okay, so now, given all that that we defined, what is the logarithmic negativity? What is the alpha logarithmic negativity? It's defined like this. We take the state row AB, we do a partial transpose, and then this new alpha can be thought of as like a comparison measure. We compute like uh, a comparison between that state and a PPT state. And we take the infimum, the smallest possible value. Okay, and um, that's the idea. What, what is interesting and had not really, as far as I'm aware, had not really been done before this work was we're comparing an unphysical object, generally unphysical, right? We said if we take an entangled state and we compute the partial transpose, we do, we do not necessarily end up with a quantum state again. So the, the resulting object is a Hermitian operator that could have negative eigenvalues. And then we're comparing that to the closest PPT state. So just to be clear, the PPT states uh, is, is defined like this, positive semi-definite operators, sigma AB greater than zero, uh, the partial transpose greater than zero, the trace equal to one. So that's how we define it. And um, yeah, so the, the thing that happens is that if alpha is one, we get the usual negativity. You can kind of inspect the formulas and see why that happens. If alpha is one, then this power is zero. And so it's kind of like this sigma is the identity operator. And then the alpha here is one, and then the X is the partial transpose of row AB. And then the whole thing just collapses to the one norm, the trace norm of the partial transpose of row AB, and that's how negativity was defined. The other extreme is alpha going to infinity, and uh, that, that was another contribution of this work, that that is in fact the kappa entanglement. And then when we saw that, we said, oh, okay, this can also be called max logarithmic negativity. Okay, so let's discuss some of the properties of the alpha logarithmic negativities. First is this ordering property. So they're ordered, and this is very similar to how Renyi relative entropies are ordered. So um, if the parameter alpha is less than beta, that means that the, you know, this alpha logarithmic negativity is less than this one. 
and then the smallest one in the family is in fact the logarithmic negativity. To prove this, we were able to use uh, results in Salman Begi's paper. We did have to extend them to the case uh, when, when X is a Hermitian operator. Salman's paper was all about when X is positive semi-definite, but many of the proofs went through pretty directly. Okay, so that's what I was saying here. Uh, it follows from generalizing Salman's work. And the particular generalization of this is this. Um, I don't know, you can kind of inspect this, but this, this was the basic idea. Um, so having this inequality, which is what followed directly from Salman's paper, this in fact implies this one. And then, you know, log is a monotone function. Um, because this new is defined in terms of a norm. Um, no, the new has the log, sorry. The new has the log. So once you have this, you just take an infimum over the PPT states and then you automatically get the, the statement here. Okay. Limits, as we said, we already argued that when you take the limit as alpha goes to one, you get logarithmic negativity and then that's the lowest member in the family. The other limit is the um, cap entanglement. So that was something we, we proved. Um, I, I forget how long it took, but it's, it's kind of intuitive. Um, if you define new infinity, uh, if, if you plug into the expression that we had previously, that'll be the Shatten infinity norm or the spectral norm of this operator. And then this is a generalization of max relative entropy. Uh, that was defined by Nil and John Adata in 2008, I think. And um, the generalization is to allow X to be a, a Hermitian operator, not just positive semi-definite. So with that, we can, we can prove this statement that, um, you know, define the max logarithmic negativity like that. We can prove that that is equal to the limit as the out of the alpha logarithmic negativity as alpha goes to infinity. And that's also equal to cap entanglement. So that was interesting for Shin and I to be able to place uh, this operational quantity as the largest in a family that interpolates uh, all the way down to the well-known logarithmic negativity entanglement measure. Okay, so then another thing that happens is that if row AB satisfies this condition, so that let's unwrap this a bit, you take the partial transpose, you then take the absolute value of the matrix. That's the same as like if I have a matrix X, if I do x dagger x, take the square root of that, that's the absolute value of x. Okay, so you do that, and then you take the partial transpose again. And if such a condition holds, then all the alpha logarithmic negativities collapse, and they're just equal to the original logarithmic negativity. So it happens for certain special cases. It happens for Pure states, two qubit states, Werner states, and bosonic Gaussian states. Um, so I don't know if I'm getting all the names of the authors correct, but the first one here I think is Audenard. And then uh, this one is Ishizaka. And then this is Audenard, Planio, and Isard. Okay, so let's talk about the. Um, entanglement monotone property in a bit more detail. We talked about PPT preserving instruments previously, but now we have a more mathematical definition. It's a collection of uh, maps, it's also called super operators, where each one is a completely positive map. Uh, this map where you do partial transpose NX and then partial transpose is CP, completely positive, and the sum map is trace preserving. So this is called a um, 
PBT preserving instrument. Okay. And what we can show is a generalization of this, the statement that Planio made for logarithmic negativity. So we can say that um, it's an entanglement monotone and uh, the entanglement does not increase on average under a PPT preserving instrument, of which a special case is a, an LOCC instrument. Okay, so that's the basic statement. And that's, a lot, that's what allows us to say that alpha logarithmic negativity is an entanglement measure, okay? So in the previous work, Planio had shown this for logarithmic negativity. Shin and I had shown it for kappa entanglement, and now we get it for the whole family. Okay, how do you prove it? Well, uh, we, we turn to the paper of Salman Beggy, and uh, we realized that um, the methods from his paper could be generalized pretty easily. So the way we did it is, there was that new alpha mathematical measure of kind of the closeness of X and sigma. And we showed that does not increase under a positive and trace not increasing map. Okay, so that was one thing we had to use. Uh, the other thing we used is that if you evaluate these quantities for bipartite operators that have a classical quantum structure, then this inequality holds. So um, I think that was just kind of plugging in a bit and um, using convexity of the norm and some kind of evaluation of leftover uh, quantities. So uh, I forget exactly, but it's, it's there in our paper. We probably had to use um, concavity of the logarithm, something like that. Okay, the other thing is that uh, the alpha logarithmic negativity, it can be calculated by convex optimization. So that means that you can, uh, you can write a MATLAB program to calculate it, okay? And why does that follow? Well, one thing we can show is that the mu function, remember that's the same as the new function, but without the log, we could show that this function is convex. And then from that, we can deduce that if you're doing this optimization where you're taking an infimum since it's over a convex set and the function is convex, the optimization is a convex optimization. Okay, so this is something that we could prove from works of HEI. So he had a paper, he had two papers, or no, I think this is the same paper and there's some theorem, but like to really understand it and why this would hold, you would need to consult some remarks that he made for the next theorem as well. Faithfulness, that holds. Um, for the alpha logarithmic negativity. I guess I already defined a few times what faithfulness means, so you can just look at it here. It's not convex, so, you know, if it were convex, this inequality would hold. What's going on? Convexity is the statement. See here, we have a, a first state, row one AB. We have a second state, and we're taking an equal mixture of them to get this average state, rho, ha, rho bar. Okay, so if the measure were convex, uh, then this, the opposite inequality would hold. But what we did is we, we found examples, very simple examples of two qubit states where when you plug them in, convexity is violated. So it means the measure is not convex. Why is convexity um, intuitive? Under certain circumstances, you can understand it as um, if you discard classical information, then the entanglement would not go up. Um, but that only holds in certain circumstances and not for the, the alpha logarithmic negativities. So, um, you know, 
the point is that this is an example, at least the max logarithmic negativity, it has an operational meaning, but it's not convex. And so, you know, we, we take that and we understand it as, well, maybe convexity is not really essential for an entangled measure. And I think we could even understand that from, from Plano's work. But the difference is that uh, the, the max logarithmic negativity, it has an operational meaning. And so that, that really tells you that, oh, indeed, it's not necessary for entanglement to be convex and still have a meaning. Okay. The other thing is monogamy. So now, indeed, we will define it. I kind of described it in an intuitive way when we talked about quantum cryptography, right? So um, if Alice and Bob have a maximally entangled state, then no one else in the rest of the universe can, can be entangled with Alice or Bob. Um, so there's, you know, you can go away from that ideal situation and then you can think about this kind of thing. And this is the statement of the mon monogamy of entanglement. So if you add up the individual entanglement, let's say we have a tripartite state. So row ABC, right? Um, so we can look at the reduced state on row AB. We can look at the reduced state on row AC. We can calculate the entanglements of those states, add them up, and then uh, the measure is monogamous if the sum of those entanglements is less than the entanglement that Alice can have with Bob and Charlie, if we do the split between Alice and Bob Charlie as a single system. Okay, so this was proposed as some kind of intuitive criterion for entanglement, but um, as it turns out, uh, the, the kappa entanglement is not monogamous. And so, you know, we can read that as, oh, similar to convexity, we can have an operationally meaningful entanglement measure, and yet it need not be monogamous. So it calls into question whether this is a necessary property. It was some intuition that Barbara Terhall had and formulated in 2004, and then it, it got to be some kind of, um, you know, important property that people would consider in the context of entanglement theory. But what this tells us is that it's not really absolutely necessary. Um, it's just like an interesting property. Okay, so if we consider this state of three qubits, you know, Alice has one qubit, Bob has one qubit, and Charlie has another, then you can show that the monogamy is violated. And it's violated for logarithmic negativity, it's violated for kappa entanglement or max logarithmic negativity, and it's, valued, it's, it's violated for all the alphas. Okay. Additivity, um, what can we say there? What is additivity? If we have a uh, four-party state, but we, can, we put the cut between Alice and Bob, so we, we you know, take a four party and make it a two party. Um, but then we suppose that this is a tensor product state. An entanglement measure is additive if you know, the sum, the, the, the overall entanglement of this state is the sum of the individual entanglements across the product, right? So that's a useful property for an entanglement measure to have. Um, it's useful when considering information theoretic tasks. And it's been known for a long time that this log negativity is additive. So is the cap entanglement. That's what Shin and I showed in this paper we posted. And it was, it was critical to the cap entanglement having an operational meaning. What do we know now? Uh, for alpha strictly between one and infinity, we can say it's subadditive. We don't know whether it's superadditive. That's a very interesting open question. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we really tried to prove it. 
um, we just we just saw that it, it wasn't simple. And so, um, but maybe there's some way it can be attacked, like with uh, convex programming or or something like that. So, you know, the way that we showed additivity here was by using a technique called semi-definite programming duality. You know, so with a semi-definite program, there's a primal and there's a dual. And um, if a condition called strong duality holds, then the primal is equal to the dual. And the way that things usually go is that um, you can prove one inequality pretty easily using the primal formulation. And then you can prove the other inequality using the dual formulation. So that's what we're able to do here. Um, to do that here, uh, we, we, we did not make progress on it. And so that's why I was suggesting maybe with convex programming duality, you could do something. So that'd be very interesting to see. Okay, um, you can generalize the measure to quantum channels, right? So the logarithmic negativity of a channel, this was defined by Halevo and Werner in 2001, and they used this as a way to bound quantum capacities. So what is this? Um, if you remember the definition for a state, we took the state, we took the partial transpose, we evaluated the one norm, and then we took the log. So what we're doing now is a channel generalization of that. So what is the channel generalization of the one norm? That's what's called diamond norm. And that's defined like this. If you have a hermeticity preserving map, so it's a map that takes Hermitian operators to Hermitian operators, the diamond norm is defined like this. And it suffices to take the supremum over pure bipartite states, where the reference system is isomorphic to the channel inputs, to the maps input system. So here the hermeticity preserving map is the partial transpose of the quantum channel. And then we get this quantity. So we can do a very similar thing, right? Um, one thing you can show is uh, for the log negativity, you can write it as an optimization of the log negativity of a state that's the output of the channel. So you, you optimize the log negativity of the output state of the channel with respect to all input states. And then that, that's a theorem you can show it. We showed it in our paper. So we can then define the alpha log negativity like this, uh, just as a generalization of what we talked about on the previous slide on the last line. So that's how we define it. And then one thing we do is rec we recover the kappa entanglement of a channel. That was another thing that Shin and I defined in our prior paper. And um, in that paper, uh, we, we proved that that's the PPT simulation cost of a channel in two potentially different settings, parallel and sequential simulation settings. So to understand that more, you can look at this paper. Excuse me. And um, anyway, so it was interesting that you get that as a special case, and I guess expected at this point. So with this, I'll, I'll make some concluding statements. Um, what, what are the main insights? Well, these alpha logarithmic negativities are a family of entanglement monotones that include as extremes these two special cases. And um, much of what we're able to prove follows from techniques of Salman Beggy in his 2013 paper. Uh, these quantities have nice properties and they're neither convex nor monogamous. So going forward from here, um, this concept can be generalized. And there's some things that we've been actively working on uh, for, for a while now. Um, we saw this concept of comparing an unphysical object to a physical one in the definition of the alpha log negativity. So we were comparing the partial transpose of a state to a PPT state. So that's an unphysical object getting compared to a physical one. And this gave us a useful 
information, or, or in this case, entanglement measure. So we can we can do this with an information measure, right? So something we've been working on for a while uh, is we can compare the partial transpose of row AB to a product state using this new alpha. And the resulting measure is a classical correlation measure. And so I have this kind of funny statement here. Um, th there's kind of this community of uh, anti-discordians, you know, so there's a whole literature on uh, a measure called classical correlation and quantum discord. And there was kind of, you know, funny reactions by the, the larger quantum information community to this, to this work. And so those are the anti-discordians. And so at the same time, uh, this, this idea is relevant <laughs> to the concept of quantum discord. And so that's why I'm saying we're sending our love to the, the discord community on this one. Okay, that's all I have to say. Uh, let me show you some of these references at the end. Just to give you a sense, um, I mentioned this one, uh, Audnart, Planio, and Isert. Uh, I also mentioned how we built upon Salman Begi's work. This is the paper, that's the archive number. Uh, I mentioned Christendel's PhD thesis as a nice reference for entanglement theory. It's starting to get a little bit out of date, but it's still excellent. Um, this was the paper I mentioned about uh, trying to understand LOCC and its mathematical properties. I mentioned Fumio Hii and his paper. We, we built on some of the mathematics there. I mentioned the logarithmic negativity of a quantum channel that was first established in this paper of Halevo and Werner. Uh, let's see. The diamond norm was done by Kataev. Uh, Perez came up with the PPT criterion. Planio was the, the first to prove that log negativity is an entanglement monotone. That was done in this very nice paper. Planio and Vermonti wrote a review on entanglement theory. Eric Raines was the first to formulate the resource theory of NPT entanglement. Uh, he also did that in this paper. Barbara Terhall was the one who wrote this influential paper about monogamy of entanglement. Uh, log negativity was also defined in this paper. And then uh, Shin and I wrote this paper, uh, I guess, almost two years ago now. We did write a short version of this paper that's now been uh, accepted to physical review letters. Um, we were a bit slow with with writing that it's actually my fault um, but thankfully that that worked out and we that, that that's going to be published soon so that was the one about entanglement uh kappa entanglement all right thank you for listening if you have questions feel free to email me or call me out on twitter okay thank you